Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Michael Ashby, and I'm the director of this course. And I would like to welcome you to the summer course in English Phonetics 2010. Uh, the summer course has been going for a very long time. Uh, you're students in a tradition that goes back the best part of a hundred years. And as you see, some of the tutors, such as myself, have been here for most of that time. <laughs> anyway, for the next two weeks, you're going to be students in one of the world's greatest universities. In the middle of one of the world's greatest cities. If you... Just tonight? Yeah. Okay. If you step out and go to room 346, yeah. Molly will have your registration details and then you'll be able to follow the course. Yes, you'll be students in one of the world's greatest universities, right in the middle of one of the world's greatest cities. So it's going to be an exciting time. And I think you'll find it's going to be a time of hard work and an inspiring time, I hope. We generally find that everyone uh, on the course has uh, very great memories, makes lots of friends, and goes away. Many people go away as real enthusiasts for phonetics, and then they tend to return. Looking around the room, I can see many people who have been on step on previous occasions, and yet they keep on coming back for more. You have received a pack. Let me just tell you some practical things about your pack and what it contains. Within the pack, you will have, most of you, your ID card, this card, which is very, very important to you. You must have this card at all times to move around in UCL to get past the security officers on the doors and gates and so on. If you haven't got the card, then you will find you cannot get in. So, for example, if you go to the library or to a computer workroom, you're going to need your work. A very small number of people do not yet have a card. I believe it is top 10 to 20 people. And the news about those cards is at 10.45 this morning, that is in the first break this morning, you must go and see Molly Bennett, the secretary, She's in room 306, which is just along the corridor, outside this room. And the people without cards are in two categories. If you have successfully sent a photograph and it hasn't been returned to you, then your card should be made. It should be waiting for you, even though it wasn't yet in your bag. Those of you who have not successfully sent a photograph you'll have to go to the security office uh, and have your photograph taken today. Molly will organize that. It's just a short walk across the campus and the card would be issued immediately while you're there. Do you have any questions at all about cards? I'm, I'm sorry we have to walk around with labels on, but that's the way it is in uh, London and in University College. Your pack also has another card, or rather a label, on which you may write your name in the form that you would like people to use it, so that other people in your room and your tutors can look at you and pronounce your name correctly. After a bit, you may want to replace the spelling of your name with the transcription of your name, the phonetic transcription of your name, would be the best thing for me, for example. Also in your pack, you find uh, a handbook, the bound handbook, which contains most of the material for the morning lectures on SCEP. You'll need the handbook with you for every lecture you come to in order to follow the examples and the diagrams. Copies of those lectures will also be made available day by day on the online course, Skep Online, and most lecturers will also make available uh, copies of any slides that they have used in addition to the handout. But I haven't put them there before the lecture, 
just in case you feel lazy and decide to stay in bed and read the lecture on your computer instead of coming here. Inside the handbook, in addition to the material about the lectures, are various bits of practical information and reference material. I must tell you a few things about your own safety, and so please refer to the very last page of the book, page 127, which is written in very large letters and tells you what to do in case of fire. This is my first duty. If you look around you, you will see green signs on every wall which say fire exit. If the fire alarm sounds, make your way out of the nearest exit and follow the further signs, which you will find everywhere. And you assemble, as it says, in Huntley Street. At the front of the book is a map of the area, and you'll see where Huntley Street is. But basically, it's round the corner of this building, round the corner of the cruciform building. It says, assemble at the opposite side of the road, outside the Jeremy Bentham pub. You notice it says outside the pub, <laughs> <laughs> not inside the pub. The map also shows you where this cruciform building is in relation to the main UCL campus. UCL is a huge university and it has premises all over the central part of London but you'll be operating just in a few of them. Some of you will have classes across the road in the Chadwick Lecture Theatre, which is directly across the road and in the front of the main college. Kate's classes will be in there, and one of the afternoon air training sessions is in there as well. Between here and there is a pedestrian crossing to cross Gower Street. Please cross the road using the pedestrian crossing. Um, remember that Gower Street is a one-way street, so whichever way you're expecting the traffic to come from, you will make a mistake either on the way there or on the way back. Um, obey the traffic signals and cross safely. It is true, it is true that we are close to University College Hospital, <laughs> which is one of the greatest hospitals in the world, but I don't have time to come and visit you in there if you cross the road unsafely, so please come and go safely. Once in the Chadwick Theatre, you will find different fire exit instructions, so those people who are over there, please have a look at what to do within the Chadwick in the event of an emergency. So I told you something about items which affect your safety. Something now about the organization of the summer course and the day, the plan of the day. A lot happens in every day, and you'll see that on page seven and onwards is a printed version of the timetable. This is the same as the timetable which is available online in Skep Online. Every day after today we'll begin at 9 o'clock with a lecture. Here is today. And you'll see that at the top of the timetable three columns are indicated. It says EFL, Strand A groups, B groups, C groups, this merely shows a division which applies in the afternoons when you go to different types of class according to your uh, needs or selections. Each group number on the list of groups you have is accompanied by a letter A, B, and C, and that's an indication, a suggestion of which uh, strand of activity you should follow in the afternoon. Right now, and for much of the course, you're all together. So we just have registration. We can go on. Now he has been doing the introduction, and everyone is here together. There's no splitting up at all today, in fact. 
the structure of the day after that, well, I mentioned 10.45, the time when you can go and see Molly, for example, about your uh, ID card, or about anything else, such as the social events. That is from 10.45 to 11.15. The bad news is there is nowhere in this particular building to buy a cup of coffee. This building has a library and classrooms and laboratories, but it doesn't have a coffee bar. However, there are places across the road, which you'll cross safely, <laughs> or in the neighboring streets, or in the Rockefeller building, which is another part of UCL directly across the street to see the map. Basically, when you look at the map, anywhere where there's a picture of a teacup should be a place to have some coffee. Those are the university college outlets anyway. Um, so that's the coffee break. Lunch every day will take place at 1 o'clock until 2 o'clock. Again, you have to leave the building in search of lunch. And even if you buy your lunch, you should not bring it back in here. They won't let you into the building with food and drink. You have to eat it elsewhere or uh, in the park, depending on the weather. And classes always finish by 4 o'clock each day. On many of the afternoons, there will be at 2 o'clock an ear training session. And then at 3 o'clock, another lecture, another big lecture, which should be of interest to almost everyone. But today, being the first day, is a little bit different. That's why this example shows you what's happening tomorrow, that is Tuesday. Today is different because at 1 o'clock today we have the group photograph which is the gathering uh, across the road under the front portico of UCL on the steps to produce a large picture of the whole group together. You should be in the photograph whether or not you decide to purchase one. Your friends will want to see you even if you don't want to travel home with a great big roll of paper. Um, and we would like to have you on the photograph too. And there's a further event today, which is a welcome tea party. <coughs> this takes place at Chandler House, which is the location of the phonetics department of UCL now, the speech, hearing and phonetic science department, is not in the cruciform building, it's not across the road in the main campus, it's about one kilometer away in a special building, and I'll give you instructions later on this morning how to gather and walk to Chandler House if you don't know how to get there. Basically, it is one kilometer away directly to the east so it's 10 or 15 minutes walk. Starting from tomorrow, the three strands of groups will do something different in the afternoon. So here's tomorrow afternoon, where one group will have ear training in here, at first with me. Another group will have ear training in the Chadwick Theatre, with Dr. Wharton and Dr. Harrison, Tim and Phil, and then a third group will have special classes uh, organized by Professor Taniguchi and Professor Toyota uh, and others. So I'm almost ready to start telling you something about speech, something real about speech. But before I do, are there any questions at all about the practical organization of the course which you need to raise at this time? I mentioned the social events. Jeff has a question. Yes, there, is, there are two questions. Thank you. Please go ahead. Okay, your pack will be waiting 
in Molly's office, 306. You can go and get it right now if you like. And then you'll have the handout. So if you care to walk through here, turn to your right, you can get it straight away. 306, right? 306. It's the first, second door on your right. That was a simple question. <laughs> <laughs> and another. Is there a free Wi-Fi uh, wi connection here? Yes. Um, the, I should explain a little bit about computing. There's lots of information about uh, computing on the UCL pages. Once you have your UCL ID and your UCL password, then you have all the privileges of a normal UCL student as far as computing uh, goes. So while you are on the main campus, for example in this building or elsewhere, you have access to a wireless network called EduRoam. If you, when you turn on your computer and see what networks you can find, choose the one called EduRoam and follow the instructions and it works beautifully. You should be online wherever you are on the main campus. Uh, there is no Wi-Fi connection in the halls of residence. In the halls of residence, there are wired connections. You need an ether. No, not in three or six. <laughs> Would you mind just helping you? In the halls of residence, you need a wired connection. Um, in some, such as John Dodgson House, that is part of the deal. The wired connection is provided for you, although you have to provide the cable. In other halls, even if it says there is no connection, my advice is plug it in and see what happens. <laughs> um, I have found traveling around the world, if you go to a university or a hotel, you say, is there any internet? And they say, no. And so when nobody's looking, I plug it into the wall and, oh, it works. So <laughs> uh, it's always worth trying, uh, though it isn't guaranteed. Does that answer your question about wireless? Yes. EduRoam is the thing. If you have been before, if you've been before and set up an alternative system called RoamNet, that is still in operation, but it's not quite as good. There were other questions. Yes. Well, if you can't access the internet through the wire connection in your hall, uh, which hall is this? Uh, college. college Hall doesn't have a guaranteed internet connection, I'm afraid. And it does say this on the web page. Sorry, so, I'm College Hall on my campus. Okay, well, College Hall is a hall which belongs not to University College London, but to the University of London. These are distinct institutions. And uh, when we describe College Hall to you, I think we say there is no internet connection in the rooms. Whether if you have it, then you're lucky. Um, it may be, you know, just don't tell them. <laughs> I'm afraid I, I can't help you in College Hall. The social events. Now, many of you have uh, signed up for social events. Molly tells me there are still tickets for most events, with the exception of the Globe Theatre, which is sold out. So, no tickets for the Globe left, but all of the other events are available, including a prom concert tomorrow, as soon as tomorrow, and indeed today there is a walk. We've chosen the slightly earlier time for the tea party, 3.30, so that those who are going on the walk as well will be able to do that and still finish the day before it gets too late because today I expect it's going to be a tiring day for everybody. Brian has a question. Yes? The, the slide is correct. As I explained, the tea party starts at 3.30. The handbook says 16. 30, so please change that to 15.30. Tea party, Chandler House, 15.30. I'll make another announcement later this morning explaining how to get it done. Well now, for a few minutes, 
something, just a very brief introduction to phonetics. I'm afraid you're going to get two lectures from me this morning. Uh, this is most unusual. <laughs> Don't worry, it won't happen on other mornings. On other mornings you'll have uh, proper lecturers, different lecturers speaking to you, but this morning it's me twice. And this first one always is mainly taken up with practical things, followed by a very brief introduction to what phonetics is about. Phonetics is the science of speech. We're interested in how speech sounds are made. We're interested in what they're like as acoustic signals when we analyze them. We're interested in how we hear them, how we perceive them. You probably know that phoneticians make use of an international phonetic alphabet. There is a copy of the alphabet in your handbook. For you to refer to. I think it's on page um, 104 of this year's handbook. And with practice, full time students of phonetics can become very skillful at using all of the provisions of this alphabet and dealing with all of the sounds in human languages. So, for example, this is the kind of thing my postgraduate students do. Here are some nonsense words, just sounds from the world's languages put together into strange combinations. I know if I go into my MA class and dictate these, then the students will take them down virtually perfectly probably about 95% correct. And so they'll write down exactly what I had in mind when I started. But your goals are not like that. In two weeks we're not going to do that. We're going to look at phonetics as it applies to English. When the IPA, when the International Phonetic Alphabet is applied to English, we get transcriptions of English speech looking like this. This says, a flotilla of four orbiting spacecraft has given scientists their first clear glimpse of the shock wave produced when particles pouring out of the sun collide, and it goes on like that. It's a bit from a little science item in a magazine. And the point is that it represents a particular way of pronouncing that passage. You notice it says, flotilla of four orbiting. So the word flotilla, a little fleet, normally doesn't have any R at the end, but when I say a flotilla of, I always put in the R between flotilla and the word of. For, for me, has no R. I don't say for, for, but I do say for orbiting. I insert the R between for and orbiting. So that's the kind of thing that you will have to do when you're transcribing and practicing. We want to represent real pronunciations, not artificial pronunciations plucked out of context and made perfect. In the next line is something even more surprising. The third word there, that thing here, it says what is written is scientists. Scientists. Notice it has no T in it. You can say scientists, of course, the word scientist, called this plural scientists, but if you speak it quickly and casually, you can easily say scientists missing out the T. That's the kind of thing we're interested in. As you go around, I want you to listen for people saying the word scientists and see, how the, is they putting, are they putting the T in or not? Am I hearing it with the T or without it? And of course, there are many, many such words, guests, often pronounced guess. Yes. So that's just an example. So applied to English, the International Phonetic Alphabet gives us that. <coughs> there are some symbols to be learned. You must learn phonetic symbols in order to make sense of this kind of thing and in order to use it for yourselves. And so on page 103 of your handbook, you have a list of phonetic symbols here is part of that list, beginning with the vowels. <coughs> Symbols on the left and on the right, various keywords, which in my accent contain the sounds of history. Learning the sounds of 
course, is different from learning the symbols. Knowing the symbols doesn't mean you know the sounds. Many people know the symbols without being able to make and recognize the sounds very well. What the symbols do is give you a way of talking about the sounds, representing the sounds, and as Daniel Jones said, the real use of symbols for learners in English is in getting to understand which sounds to use when. You need to know which sounds you should be aiming at in a particular word or phrase. Knowing the symbols isn't magic, it won't make, make you produce the sounds or recognize them, but it does give you a way of representing them and talking about them to other people. The symbols are far better for this purpose than ordinary spelling. You're aware of the deficiencies in English spelling. Uh, here is a simple example. The vowel F as in dress. Here are three different spellings of it, either with the letter E, or letters EA, or indeed with the letter A. Many, any, Thames, these are words where the letter A represents the sound F strange. So the spellings would not be a good way of talking about the sounds in English. And that pattern is repeated many times down this list. Here's another one. The sound a, as in strut. It may be written with a U or an O or with two O's, as in these words mud, love, blood. They've all got exactly the same sound in them. The spelling is just difficult. And then we have the opposite thing, where there is one spelling, but several sounds. <coughs> Same spelling, E-A, is found in head, and C, and break. Three different vowels represented. So if we tried to use the spelling, we would never be able to talk clearly about the sounds of these words. We'd be in a constant muddle. The first word in each line has been chosen carefully. It's not a random choice of illustrative word. It's the name of what is called the standard lexical set, as set up by John Wells in his uh, great book on English accents. And it gives us a way of naming that category. So when I want to talk about this vowel, I don't say e, I don't draw a funny picture in the air. None of this will work. I say kit. Kit. And then everyone who knows this system knows what I'm talking about. Because there is no other word that's a bit like kit with which you mix it up. It doesn't matter how badly you try to pronounce the word kit, almost anybody will say, oh, he means kit. The same goes for the others. So, kit is the first of those sets. Dress is a similar set. Trap, and so on. The usefulness of this system is obvious. It gives us a way of talking about processes and sets of sounds in English. For example, we can say that currently in English there is in progress a process called goose fronting. Sounds rather quaint, doesn't it? Goose fronting is in pro progress in RP. That means that the vowel which we use in words like goose is undergoing a change. It is becoming more front. Older speakers like me have a back of vowel, goose. But my children think this is silly. They laugh when I say words like goose because they say something more like goose, 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 goose. And as you listen to your tutors of different ages, you should be able to detect different stages of goose fronting according to their uh, age. There's nothing wrong with goose fronting, it's what's happening. If you're 25 or 30 years old, you should probably adopt goose fronting. You will sound antique if you adopt goose rather than goose. Anyway, the point about that is not to teach about goose fronting, but rather to show the utility of the name of the standard lexical set. Well now, 
we come to 950, uh, or thereabouts, very close to 950. I'm going to save the next few slides, which have to do with stress, the beginnings of stress and intonation, until my second lecture this morning. And what is going to happen now is that you have to find your way to your first practical class. 